study and prayer meeting is on this Wednesday evening, half past seven, uh, online and also a meeting in Cardiff Hall. And the new bulletin, as you can see, is available in the foyer, along with the prayer bulletin from uh, Jim Carsinger on behalf of the Missions Committee. The next Lord's Day after the morning service here is the fellowship luncheon, fellowship luncheon, so everyone is invited. And, uh, and Sunday school will resume next Lord's Day uh, at 4.15. And all the other important information, including the schedule for the communion season, uh, they are all printed there, or subject to the will of God. So let us worship God. Let us sing to God's praise by singing uh, from the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 147, Psalm 147, Psalm 147, and we shall sing to God's praise and glory uh, from verses 1 to 7, verses 1 to 7, and here we have this declaration, praise ye the Lord, for it is good, praise to our God. To sing, for it is pleasant and to praise, it is a comely thing. God doth build up Jerusalem, and it is, it is, and he it is alone, that the dispersed of Israel doth gather into one. And so here, uh, we are given this reason for giving uh, thanks to praise God. Why? Because not only is God the one who has created all things. But he is the one who built up Jerusalem. What is Jerusalem? Uh, the place where God has promised to have his uh, presence, his name dwell. And ultimately points us to that uh, eternal dwelling place. Uh, the one who would come to be that faithful Israel. The one who would come in whom we may know that presence of God. Emmanuel, the Lord Jesus Christ. And... Uh, not only does he gather the dispersed of Israel, he gathered, he gathers still today his uh, sinful people from all nations, tongues, and tribes. And so we see um, even the number of it. Uh, in verse 4, he counts the number <clears throat> of the stars. He names them, everyone. Great is our Lord, and of great power his wisdom search can none. The Lord lifts up the meek and Cast the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord and give him thanks and have his praises sound. And so here we are given this picture of a thanksgiving in the temple, a temple worship. And we are reminded this thanksgiving must be through that sacrifice and how wonderful it is. We are given that perfect sacrifice, the one who is. Uh, our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us sing to God's praise, verses 1 to 7 of Psalm 147.
let us uh, unite together in prayer. Let us uh, call upon the name of the Lord. Let's rise. O sovereign and almighty God, we do join with the psalmist and the people of God of all ages to confess great is our Lord and of great power. His wisdom search can none. O almighty and ever-blessed God, as we bow in that divine presence this afternoon, we realize that we come before the throne of glory and of majesty beholding not only that glory, power, and greatness, but also uh, the beauty of holiness, and help us to truly do so by faith alone. And that help us, O Lord, to come with gladness, with thanksgiving, uh, and in song and in, in singing and praise, that we can come uh, before the one who is worthy of the praises of all creatures. And so, Lord, we do come uh, confessing uh, as a people of God that we are so indebted uh, to the Lord for that divine goodness, not only for creating us, not only in giving us all the temporal blessings, in providing for our daily needs, but, Lord, we are rejoicing and we rejoice in that saving mercy, in that covenant loving kindness in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is risen from the dead, the one who is not only risen, but he is indeed ascended and enthroned as the King of kings. And it is only through him that we can call upon the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Lord, we do not come uh, with our own initiative, but we rather come humbly at the powerful command and gracious invitation of our great God and Savior. And Heavenly Father, as believers, uh, we are so thankful for that uh, wonderful, amazing, effectual call by the Word and Spirit of God, calling us out of uh, the pit of sin, the mire of iniquity and depravity, and the, and the den of death, into that powerful, glorious kingdom of light in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, uh, we, uh, as we gather this afternoon, uh, we also pray uh, that powerful word uh, and that uh, powerful drawing of the Holy Spirit that would be bestowed upon us this afternoon, so that we would be drawn once again away from ourselves, away from the sinful cares of this world, away from the deceitfulness of riches, away from the deceitfulness and the deception of our own hearts, so that we may truly come to worship in spirit and in truth. And we come with great delight in the free grace found in the Lord Jesus Christ, our only Lord and Redeemer, the one who by his shed blood can purify us, the one who, can, who is able and willing to make us whiter than the snow. And so, Lord, help us, therefore, as we bow this afternoon, to truly come expectantly, to come with joy and delight, confessing, though by nature we are wandering sheep, but we are blessed to have the Lord Jesus Christ, the Shepherd King, the one who uh, constantly pursues us with his love and who constantly grants us his word, as we were reminded this morning, even that instruction through the angel uh, to, uh, to the women to uh, tell the disciples and Peter, oh gracious God, remind us that we uh, by nature wandering sheep desperately need that glorious, faithful, loving shepherd who draws, who can draw us back to himself. And so, Heavenly Father, uh, we uh, pray that we may truly know how much we need the rich Savior who is rich in love and mercy and help us uh, to truly rejoice in him as we gather for worship. Uh, help us to 
uh, by faith enter into the courts of heaven where Christ is. Uh, help us to do so with thanksgiving and praise. Help us to feed upon him, uh, the one who is uh, the bread of life eternal. And help us uh, not to find a refuge in the things of this world. And so, uh, Heavenly Father, draw us uh, by the Word and Holy Spirit to Him who is our only Emmanuel. And may we know of that joy unspeakable and full of glory. And we humbly ask that the whole worship service this afternoon will be directed, will be governed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And Lord, in all that we seek to do, uh, in this uh, this gathering, we pray our triune God will be glorified. And so, Heavenly Father, we once again remember those you're not able to gather this afternoon to worship with us, and we pray that they may know more and more the sustaining grace, the upholding hand of the Lord in the midst of their trials and sicknesses, and help them to know uh, the help, the presence of the Lord in the midst of their challenges. And guide and lead us as a people, as a congregation. And Lord, we pray that even the youngest who the oldest among us here may confess it is good to be here in the house of God. And so, Lord, help us and guide us and forgive us for we have, uh, for we have many sins. And pardon them all, for we ask all these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. For the scripture reading for this afternoon, the first reading is from Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. And I'll read from verses 1 to 6. Verses 1 to 6 of Isaiah 51. And then the second reading is Ephesians chapter 5. Isaiah 51, and here we have this wonderful call uh, to the people of God, for he is the one who comforts his people, and that is reason for thanksgiving, as we shall see. Isaiah 51, verses 1 to 6. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you are unto the hole of the pit from which ye were uh, dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest. As a light of the peoples, my righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. Amen. And the second reading is uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians 5, and I'll read from verse 8 all the way to 21, verses 8 to 21 of Ephesians chapter 5. To hear the word of the Lord. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. 
for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. And therefore he say, says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father and the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Amen. May the Lord bless his holy and inerrant word. At this point of the service, the offering for the Lord's work is to be received. Well, let us continue our worship by singing from Psalm 26 from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 26, and we shall sing to God's praise and glory from verses 7 to 12. Verses 7 to uh, 12. And here we have the psalmist uh, praising God with the voice of thanksgiving, that I, with voice of thanksgiving, may publish and declare and tell of all thy mighty works that great and wondrous are. So here the psalmist is not uh, using this opportunity to uh, give thanks to himself, but giving praise and thanks to God and all the mighty works and how wondrous, how great and how mighty they are. And, uh, and he speaks of his uh, love for God's house, because it is where God's presence is found, the habitation of thy house. Lord, I have loved it well. Yea, in that place I do delight, where doth thine honor dwell. Yes, the place of God is dwelling, uh, is where his name is glorified, his honor is found. And, uh, and so this desire, uh, we, we see it as he expresses, not just with his voice of thanksgiving, but a heart of thanksgiving, he, he loves the place uh, where God's presence is found. His word is magnified. And uh, also the desire to live in holiness, in thanksgiving, with sinners gathered not my soul, and such as blood would spill, whose hands, mischievous plots, uh, right hand, uh, corrupting bribes do fill. But as for me, I will walk on in mine integrity, do thou redeem me, and, O oh Lord, be merciful to me. Yes, that integrity not out, uh, ultimately comes from the perfect righteousness of another, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us sing to God's praise, uh, verses 7 to 12 of Psalm 26. <laughs>
Well, dear congregation, we can feel like the world that we live in is increasingly full of doom and gloom, with the economy, with the rising cost of living, with the political incompetence, instabilities in many areas of our lives. You know, there can be so many reasons for sadness, for grief, for complaining. It is not that difficult to hear, even as we go to the grocery store, or seeing the bills coming in, as well as reading the headlines on the news, it's not difficult to find the noise of grumbling complaining, whinging from other people, and even from ourselves. In fact, a news article about two weeks ago, let me read you the headline. It goes like this, Australia is among the the top 10 most miserable countries in the world. And underneath that, it says, many people around the world continue to feel the lingering effects of the pandemic with a recent survey revealing a particular grim picture for all Aussies. Well, according to the latest Mental State of the World report, it shows that Australia is the sixth unhappiest country in the world, having some of the lowest scores for optimism, lowest some of the lowest scores for drive and motivation, as well as adaptability and resilience. And maybe as we hear these statistics, we are not that surprised. We can easily join in with the majority of our nation in sighing, in criticisms, in complaining. While it may be true that it has become a national trend, that it has become perhaps even the talk and attitude of the day, feeling that sense of gloom. It may may even be the characteristics of many citizens in our country. But dear congregation, have we considered what characterizes And what kind of attitude that describes the citizens of another country, another domain. I'm not talking about countries like Dominican Republic or Sri Lanka that are on the top, on the list of the top happiest countries in the world. I'm not... I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the heavenly country, the kingdom of God. In other words, dear believers, are we simply following the pattern of the world, the pattern of our nation here in Australia? Or is there something different that a believer in Christ is to live differently in that regard? The answer is, yes, there is, as that is part of a spirit-filled life. And that is something that the believers in Ephesus needed to be exhorted uh, as well. And so let us continue on in our series, in the letter to the Ephesians. And this is what we can write over in the sermon as our theme this afternoon. The spirit-filled life of gratitude the Spirit-filled life of gratitude. And we hope to, with the Lord's help, consider verse 20 here in chapter 5 in Ephesians. And we hope to do so under the three thoughts. Firstly, the resistance to this exhortation. Secondly, the relation found in this exhortation. And thirdly and finally, the Redeemer over this exhortation the Spirit-filled life of gratitude, the resistance, the relation, and finally, the Redeemer. Well, dear congregation, as many of us know that throughout our series thus far, 
the Apostle Paul has been writing to the believers in Ephesus. And especially from chapter 4 onward, he has been writing to them concerning the implication of the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the lives of believers. Once again, we ought to be reminded that the gospel of Christ is not only addressing the heads, simply head knowledge and nothing else. No. It also changes our hearts. It also brings, it moves our hands in how we live our day-to-day lives as children of light. As we know, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he has been writing about the life of the children of light, walking in wisdom, in a life filled with the Holy Spirit, by the means of the Spirit. And we see that from our previous studies in this series, that the Spirit-filled life has so much to do with the Word of God. The Word of God breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Yes, even in how we worship the Lord, even in how we encourage one another and the fellowship of God's people. But the Spirit-filled life is not simply confined to how we make use of the songbook given by God in worship and in fellowship. This spirit-filled life has so much to do with our attitude in our daily living. In other words, friends, the Christian life is far beyond having just a theology in our heads. But there must be the doxology in our hearts and in our lives. As we can see what the Word of God says in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, maybe as we hear these words, we don't give too much thought about this. Perhaps we may say to ourselves, well, it's only natural. And we may say, well, I've heard this verse so many times. I just heard in, in the car that my children, this verse is one of the verses that the children learn in their schoolwork. And maybe, boys and girls, when you hear this verse, and you may say, well, yes, I try to be thankful. But friends, if we truly pay attention on this verse, we may realize something very different, something about you and about me. And so let us consider our first point, the resistance to this exhortation, the resistance. Well, dear congregation, when Paul writes to the Ephesians, and we see that uh, just like in the previous verses, when he writes that, these verses here, it is not optional. Paul is not saying to the believers there, well, Folks, would you, would you consider being thankful once in a while when it is convenient for you to do so, when there is time for it? Think about it, please. No, not at all. It is a command. It is an exhortation. Because in the Greek, it is in the imperative. Not only that, this exhortation is not written to only some of the believers, only those who may seem to be less appreciative, uh, those who may be less thankful. No, it is written to all. And we see that this command to give thanks is not once in a while, a few times a week, but in giving thanks always, lifelong, For all things, dear congregation, do we begin to see this verse, this command, in a different light? 
rather than something that we think can naturally flow out of us constantly, automatically, and naturally. Boys and girls, I'm sure you understand something of that, don't you? Well, children, I am very certain all of you here, children, uh, have been told by your parents from time to time, uh, and maybe more so when you were a wee bit younger, told by your mum and dad to say thank you to other people, to those who have been kind to you. Well, why? Why did they have to say, it, say that to you? Why do, why do they have to um, tell you from time to time? It is because you needed this reminder, otherwise you would forget. You would be unthankful. And indeed, do we see that this truth, this reality, presses home, not just for the children, but for you and for me, older ones? Do we see the reason why we have this exhortation, even as believers? It tells us that by nature, rather than being thankful, we are unthankful. And Romans 1, 21, the first part, reminds us, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. How humbling it is as we come to see that the word here, the, the exhortation, the command, is not addressing unbelievers, those who live godless lives at that time in Ephesus. No, rather this command and exhortation is given to believers, not just those who are new to the Christian faith, but older ones too. It tells us the great temptation. It tells us the great tendency to be unthankful to God going back to the old man. In other words, unthankfulness and ingratitude is what characterizes every single one of us, no matter how old or young we are by nature, ever since the fall. And yes, it is possible that we can be saying thanks and to be so very polite in our manner with other people. Yet all the while, there is that most important gratitude that is missing in our lives, that true thankfulness to God. Isn't it true? Even as believers, we can forget this gratitude. If we are honest with ourselves, how often we can find ourselves grumbling and complaining, just like the rest of the world than having that gratitude in our hearts to the Lord. Even in the Christian life, it is possible that we confine thanksgiving to no more than the time when we are just about to eat. Dear believers, have you come to see your and my own resistance to this exhortation? Even in the Christian life. It seems so natural for us to find many reasons for grumbling, but not many reasons for gratitude. Yes, this is a problem also with the believers in Ephesus, in the Ephesian congregation. Remember their own situation at that time. Think about them. Being a relatively new congregation in Ephesus, in a city that is dominated by the temple of Diana, nearly everywhere in their society, they can see, they can experience so much ungodliness, so much depravity. The church there would not be strong in number. They would be so weak, even in resources. Many of them would have been quite despised. Many of them would be quite rejected by their friends and loved ones. Some even being cut off by their own family. 
for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them would be living in poverty. And not only that, they are, remember, they are living in an empire with many ungodly rulers, with so much persecution going on, along with those wicked government policies. Not ashamed to single out Christians. Besides that, remember the situation within the congregation, the internal strife between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. In other words, friends, do you see that the days of the believers then are not easy? There can be so many reasons for grumbling and complaining. Do we see that they, not only us, would have found this exhortation extremely challenging, especially as we come to see that there is this resistance in us. And dear people of God, this exhortation reveals to you and to me the life of gratitude. That life of gratitude cannot be down to our genes, but the grace of God worked by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the exhortation here is to continuously be giving thanks always for all things. As we think about these words, do we realize how fallen short we are in and of ourselves, even after tasting the grace of God? Dear people of God, we may be thinking about perhaps how impossible it seems. Giving thanks always for all things? It seems impossible, especially, say, if we are stuck in holiday traffic or when we have a flat tire, when we're on the motorway. What about those times, parents, when you have been short with your children, running out of patience, can't handle their misbehavior? What about the day-to-day -day stress? the lingering sickness, the problems at work, the tension in the home with our loved ones? What about those times when we feel completely deflated, distressed, and depressed? How do you and I respond to this exhortation and command, giving thanks always for all things? It seems impossible. We may be wondering, we may even have this question in our heads, well, how can I give thanks in those situations, under those circumstances? And indeed, what about the cruelty? What about the tragedies? What about the hate in this world? Are we to be giving thanks always for all things. Dear believers, we need to realize that it is not the trials and sufferings themselves that need to be thankful for, but the true understanding, knowing that everything in life has been appointed by the sovereign will of God for His divine purpose. As Romans 8 Verse 28, I'm sure many of you know it by heart. All things work together for good to those who love God. Dear congregation, do we see that the spirit-filled Christian is not command, is not uh, only commanded, <clears throat> but in this exhortation, and we, we need to notice there's a difference. We're not exhorted to give thanks always to all things, but for all things to God. 
this exhortation serves as an invitation to you and to me, dear child of God, to look beyond our present circumstances and to look to the one who is sovereign over all circumstances. It is to him we give thanks. I know it is not easy, especially when we go through those dark and trying days, those storms of life, the pain and grief, as well as desolation can be so very weighty and crushing. To give thanks always for all things to God seems like an impossibility. My dear brothers and sisters, maybe this is how some of you are feeling right now. Whatever storm, whatever predicament, whatever burden that you are facing, you are carrying on your shoulders right now. Humanly speaking, we may find more resistance to this exhortation than compliance to this exhortation. It may even strike us as wrong to give thanks. But remember, Paul, remember, him here. He is not excluding. He is not excluding himself here. He knows that this exhortation and command is also for him. And children, do you remember there was a time Paul was with someone? Paul and Silas. Remember what happened to them? They were put to into prison after they were arrested by the authorities, beaten by them for preaching the gospel, humanly speaking, there is every reason for grumbling. But what did they do at midnight in prison? They were singing praises to God. They were giving thanks using God's own songbook. Maybe as we think about it, we just can't fathom it. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Maybe we have similar thoughts about Matthew Henry, son of a Puritan. Well, let me tell you something about one incident that he encountered. He was once robbed, and we may think, well, how can he possibly give thanks to God for a robbery? Well, friends, that very night, he wrote in his diary, and he says, let me be thankful. First, because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took my all, it was not much. Fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. Friends, do we begin to see something of the spirit of thanksgiving, even in the midst of trials? What we see are pictures and examples of spirit-filled believers. It doesn't speak of their own greatness or resilience, but it speaks of the greatness of God's grace. Dear people of God, it is true. You and I do not know what suffering, what trial, what difficulty we will be facing. Indeed, as an under-shepherd among you, I do not fully know the depth of those difficulties that you are going through, or will be going through as much as I would love to. But there is always one reason that we can give thanks to God, for even even in the, in the worst of circumstances, even in the worst of situations, we can praise God for being God. At all times, the one who is able and power of the Holy Spirit. 
So, friends, do you know what it means to give thanks always for all things to God, even in a small measure? Or are you only familiar with grumbling, complaining, and not gratitude? Being courteous and polite will not help us. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we come to see that? And secondly, we're to see the relation found in this exhortation, the relation. Well, let us read our text once again. And giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we understand one of the reasons for why by nature we are unthankful? Children, do you know why do you sometimes fail to say thank you to your mum and dad? Say, for lunch and dinner or breakfast? Is it not because you have begun taking these things for granted? Thinking that you deserve it. You're entitled to it. To, to, to it. And so much more so it is with a spiritual problem of ingratitude and unthankfulness. It is far beyond taking the things that we have in life for granted. By our sinful nature, ever since the fall in Adam and we in him, we want to be our own God. We want to be our own king and boss. And in that sense, there is no true and meaningful relationship with God, but hostility and alienation, living as children of wrath in spiritual darkness, as sons of disobedience, as verse 6 of our chapter reminds us. But that is not so anymore for those believers in Ephesus. This exhortation brings out this wonderful truth of the relationship with God. It is far beyond the restoration of a relationship between creatures and the Creator. It's far greater than that. Look at the exhortation. It is not simply giving thanks always for all things to God. Not just that. But giving thanks always for all things to God the Father. In other words, this thanksgiving is the fruit of a loving relationship. A relationship that we don't deserve. As we are reminded by nature, we are children of wrath. Yet here, for the believer who has come to know the grace of the Holy Spirit, God is far more than the creator to us but a father, the most perfect, the most loving, the wisest father. Friends, he is the one with whom our true thanksgiving should be directed. <coughs> Dear believers, have we truly considered the blessings, the gifts, and the benefits that God has bestowed upon us as our father? And children, I'm sure when you think of your own father, you would think of him as someone who provides for your physical needs. And so much more so it is with God, the one who supplies all of our physical needs of his people. He is the one who cares for the sparrows, the birds of the air, and all creatures. He is the one who clothes the flowers of the field. And he is the one who is so pleased to provide for all of our needs. And he is the one who knows how to give good gifts to his children more than we parents to our children. I must confess, as a father, I do not always know what is the best gift for my children. What is truly good for them. But that is not so with God, our Heavenly Father, to, to His children. 
And indeed, have we come to see all the temporal blessings, the food, the clothing, the homes, as well as many other creature comforts that we have been blessed with? They are ultimately from the hand of God, his fatherly hand. The one who is pleased to give us more than our daily bread when we don't deserve even crumbs. In fact, it is only fair to say that we are given more temporal blessings than many, if not all, in the Ephesian congregation at that time. Do we truly give thanks to God for those things? And not only that, He is the giver of every single spiritual gift. And God, our Heavenly Father, is the one who has blessed His children as chapter 1, verse 3 reminds us, bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In other words, dear people of God, we are blessed beyond measure. We are blessed with more than just the temporal blessings. And we have been blessed with the spiritual gift of the forgiveness of sins, the, the gift of salvation. And not only that, as God's people, we have been blessed with the peace with God. And there is that relationship with God. As mentioned before, this exhortation is to give thanks always for all things to God the Father. And dear people of God, do we see something that is so glorious, something that is so amazing, something that is out of this world? It speaks of the spiritual gift of adoption into the family of God that we can call God as our Father, our Abba Father. I remember sometimes in the past, some of my children thought it would be funny to call me by my first name or by my surname, not realizing that it wasn't polite. And on each occasion, I, I said to them, you know, children, there are only three in this world that can call me dad, and, not, and no other people can do that. It's so very special. And so much more so is this wonderful blessing and privilege for the people of God, even in the life of thanksgiving, of gratitude. It is not a customary thing, nor is it some kind of mere obligation, wanting to be seen polite, no, it is rather full of love to know that God is our Heavenly Father. He has graciously ad adopted us as one of His. In other words, dear child of God, we're not just living in the world. Do you see that in a different light? Do you see that you are living in your Father's world and nothing is out of His sovereign, loving control? And it is because of who He is, the Almighty, who is also our Father. Can any of you, children of God, doubt His ability to bring good out of evil, no matter how dark our circumstances are in this life. My dear brothers and sisters, <clears throat> there is not a temporal or a spiritual blessing that does not come from God, ultimately. In all things, there is a purpose of God for His glory and our good. Have we come to know that by the grace of the Holy Spirit, do we know that know God as our Heavenly Father? Do we give thanks to Him? Because if we don't, it tells us that we still belong to another family. It tells us that God is not our Father as we are still children of wrath. What we need is not to be start trying to be polite and thankful in words to God hoping that he would become our father somehow. No, that would not work. 
boys and girls, it would be like when you know that if you want to get something, and you know that you have to say please and thank you, and even though you say those things, but you don't necessarily mean those words, there is no true gratitude in heart. And what we, what do we need? Now, to be more precise, whom do we need? We need, dear congregation, the Redeemer over this exhortation. The Redeemer. Our last point. Yes, have we ever wondered how God can become our Heavenly Father? Indeed, have we truly considered how our thanksgiving can truly be acceptable by God? Well, let us read out text once again, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear congregation, do we see something that is so important? In order to know that God is our Father, in order for us to truly give thanks to God according to the Word of God, it must be through the Lord Jesus Christ the perfect Son of God, the only mediator in the covenant of grace. It tells us that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, God cannot be a father unto us, for we are by nature children of wrath. Outside of Christ, he will remain as a consuming fire, and there is no access to him as a child to his father. Friends, it tells us, it tells you that no matter how thankful we seem to be in our words and attitude to God, if it is outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not acceptable in His sight. Why? Because even in that, we are actually refusing to humble ourselves, to bow before God, to acknowledge Him as God, to lay hold of the perfect Son that He has graciously, lovingly offered in the gospel. Subtly, we are still trying to say with ingratitude, with ungratefulness, saying to God, I don't need God's way of salvation. I don't need Christ even in thanksgiving. Friends, if that is the case with you, this is a great sin, the very sin of pride, the very sin that made our very first parents cast out of paradise. Then in the light of God's word, do we see how much we need the only mediator, the only Redeemer even offered in this exhortation. Behold the Lord Jesus Christ, and the one who always gave thanks for all things to God the Father, the one who never had a second of ingratitude, never a moment of grumbling, not even once. He even gave thanks at the Last Supper, when he fully knew what that supper meant. He knew that supper. He knew that the, the bread and the cup were pointing to his impending death on the cross of Calvary with the shedding of his own blood. Why did the Lord Jesus do that? It is so that through his death and shed blood, by the power of his resurrection, many sons and daughters of wrath may be rescued, may be redeemed to become sons and daughters of God, to have God as their heavenly Father. It is only through the Lord Jesus Christ that sinners like you and like me may find that acceptance with God. Despite our grumbling, despite our complaining, because God the Father sees us in His perfect, righteous, perfectly, always thankful Son. That's how He sees His people, through His Son. 
And it is only through Christ that our hearts can be truly sanctified (coughs) from ungrateful hearts to thankful hearts, from life centering in self to life centering in the Savior, thankfulness with thankfulness to the Father by the Holy Spirit's grace. In other words, this true thankfulness is a mark of grace, a mark of sonship through the Lord Jesus. So friends, have you come to bow before this only Redeemer, this perfect Son of God, bow before Him in repentance and faith, confessing even our sins of ingratitude, even our sins of unthankfulness. And is there that fruit of love worked by the Holy Spirit to give thanks to God always in all circumstances for the Lord Jesus Christ, the indescribable gift? Dear believers, do you know of this exhortation, which is also a wonderful blessing and privilege in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who who is so pleased to grant us strength to go through even the most trying circumstances, the one who enables us by his Spirit to true, in order that we may fulfill this exhortation, this command, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we remember one child of God in particular in the Old Testament? He gave thanks to God even when the circumstance, when the future seemed so grim, when he was given the word, the warning from God that the Babylonians would come. Remember that child of God, Habakkuk, He trembled at God's word. He was fearful, but that was not the end. Rather, he ends with thanksgiving. I'll just read from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no hurt in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He makes, He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on highlands. That is a picture of true thanksgiving of a child of God who has been blessed with a life of gratitude. Is that reflected in how we live our daily lives? As individuals, but also as a congregation, despite, despite the gloom and doom of this world, knowing that nothing is outside of our Father's loving, powerful hands, because we live in our Father's world, under the Lordship of Christ. And for that, we give thanks. Amen. Well, let us conclude our worship by singing from Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116, and we shall sing to God's praise and glory from verses. 9 to 19. Verses 9 to the end. Yes, here. The psalmist speaks of his own grief and sorrow, his trials. But he also speaks of what he can uh, Render unto the Lord, because he is the one who has been so good to him, the one who is so kind and merciful to him. 
I in the land of those that live will walk to the Lord before. I did believe, therefore I speak. I was afflicted sore. I said when I was in my haste that all men liars be. What shall I render to the Lord for all his great uh, gifts to me? Out of salvation, take the cup. On God's name will I call. I'll pay my vows now to the Lord before his people all. And yes, uh, here there's a uh, desire in to live in uh, thanksgiving to God, to render thanks to him for all his gifts. And ultimately, it points us to the gift of his beloved son. And we see that in uh, verses 17 and 18, thank offerings I to thee will give and on God's name will call. I'll pay my vows now to the Lord before before his people all. Within the courts of God's own house, within the midst of thee, O city of Jerusalem, praise to the Lord give ye. And so let us uh, sing to God's praise at uh, verses 9 to 19 of Psalm 116. Let's stand. <coughs> So now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>